I will take attendance and read the pandemic language. Keith Slattery. Present. Justin Starrett. Paul Sheehan. Here. John DePriest. Here. Ron Hogan. Here. Richard Craviello. Here. Brad Rawson. Eric Barasa. Vincent Panzini. Dave Bancroft. Here. And Myra Negron Roche. Here. All right. Given the unprecedented circumstances resulting from the global coronavirus pandemic, Governor Charles Baker issued an order to provide limited relief from certain provisions of the open meeting law to protect the health and safety of individuals interested in attending public meetings. In keeping with the guidance provided, the commission will conduct a public meeting utilizing remote collaboration. Any votes will be taken by a roll call. This meet meeting is being recorded. And back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, motion to accept the minutes of the last meeting. I make a motion to accept the minutes of the last meeting. I second. second. I second. Second there. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we just we do need to do a roll call for the vote. Do a roll call. Yep, sorry. Oh, I do have the meetings, by the way, if anyone needs to see them. But yeah, we can live without them. Okay. Tiny, <laughs> right. you can call the roll, please. Sure. Keith Slattery. Yes. Sorry, was that a was that a yes? Yes. Oh. Okay. Justin Starrett. Paul Sheehan. Yeah, um, yes, aye. John DePriest? Yes. Ron Hogan? Yes. Richard Craviello? Yes. Brad Rawson is not here, nor is Eric Barasa. Finn Panzini is he here? No. Uh, Dave Bancroft? Yes. And Myra Negron Roche? Yes. All right, that is one, two, three, four, six, six in favor of approving the minutes. Okay. Next, um, uh, Joe, you ready for your, your, your uh, thing? Yes, I am. Um, so just uh, was just a quick update on a couple of things before we get into the, uh, the guidelines. I think um, as you probably all know, the governor's new guidance has um, reduced the hours that uh, the casinos are allowed to remain open. So that went into effect and is in effect and um, will be in effect, I guess, until we find out uh, something different. But uh, essentially uh, what's happened is, uh, so MGM is, they're going to be open from 10 in the morning till 9.30 at night. Uh, Plain Ridge Park is running from 7 a.m. till 9.30 at night. And Encore is running from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. I think in addition, Encore has also um, shut down the hotel until such time as, um, you know, we go back to a, a more uh, regular schedule. Uh, Jackie, did you want to add anything in on that since you're here? No, I think that that's right, Joe. Thank you. Okay. So that's sort of the, you know, the, the new things that have arisen. Um, so with respect to our guidelines, um, so the, the last time we met, you, we were going through the guidelines as they were approved by the commission for public comment. And um, we actually, we received only um, a single uh, public comment on this. And um, I thought I would just share that with you. This actually came from the uh, Metropolitan um, the MAPC, Metropolitan Area Planning Council, yep. and this was just sent in as a as an email from Raul Gonzalez, and we consider this, and, and I'll walk through it with you, the, the, some of the specifics, and, and the, the primary request here was sort of um, maybe expanding the authorization um, you know, under the, the workforce grants a little bit more. And we did make a couple of very minor corrections to the guidelines uh, with respect to that. Um, but the, um, so in the, in the main body of this, so it says, 
you know, the impact of the casino to small businesses in Chelsea and Everett were considered to be uh, competition for retail and hospitality business. Now with COVID-19, casino business is compromised and to a much further extent, local small businesses are suffering even more. So the recommendations that they are saying is um, they would like to see us add a, a new grant category to support uh, regional small businesses um, separate from workforce development. Um, so this actually is already covered under our um, community planning grant. If you recall in the past, we've had several communities coming in, trying to, you know, developing plans to work with their local businesses to try to find ways to tie business to the Encore Casino and so on. So we really think that that's already uh, pretty well covered. Um, and then on an item number two here, they talk about uh, high unemployment from hospitality and retail industries now includes, you know, unemployed from the casino itself and saying that those workers need to be upskilled to help them break into a new career if, uh, if they're not able to be reemployed by the casinos. And, um, you know, under our workforce grants, that's not something that would be prohibited. Um, you know, whoever is proposing those grants would need to, um, you know, make a good case to us that that's, that that's appropriate. Um, so um, what we do plan on doing is we're doing some outreach uh, workshops that we're gonna be doing in January for uh, communities uh, who will be applying for uh, these types of grants. We're gonna do one for workforce and one for sort of all the other grants. And we were gonna try to, we were gonna raise this as a possibility, you know, for those people who would apply for workforce grants, that that's something that they could consider uh, including um, this item number three talks about including ESOL training programs, um, that's English speakers of other languages uh, and, a, and adult basic education programs as part of the workforce grants. Um, we have been doing that um, really since the workforce uh, grants began. Um, all of these include an adult basic education component in them. Uh, in this item four, uh, digital literacy training is needed. Um, and that is something that's actually been included in a couple of our grants where uh, I know out in, out in Springfield, I just remember particularly uh, one of the groups was uh, providing, um, you know, Chromebooks to, their, to the people in there to help them with digital literacy and, and writing um, resumes and things of that nature. So we think we're covered on that, although we did add the words digital literacy into that, our sections talking about um, workforce. And then this item number five talks about wraparound supports for families, particularly on food and housing insecurity, um, as these aspects of life directly intersect with small business livelihood. Um, under the way our program is set up, we didn't think that there was anything particular that we could do with respect to that. Um, that's not really uh, kind of in the lines of community mitigation for the grants. But anyways, so this one set of comments, we felt that um, we've got it pretty well addressed um, in, in our current um, guidelines. So, um, so again, the guidelines that we gave to you the last time, they've stayed essentially the same. We did do, you know, obviously kind of scrub through them to make sure all our spelling is right and everything is good. So there's really no uh, major update to give you on that. Um, these will be going in front of the commission on Thursday for a final vote, and then we roll out the program right after that. Um, so if anybody has any particular questions on that, I would be happy to answer them. Any questions? I can't see the whole screen, so. Okay, let me uh, I'll unshare that. Okay, so I think, um, the next item we have on the agenda is Mark Vanderlinden, who's going to give us an update on our uh, our Game Sense and some of the other um, research agenda. Sure, I'm happy to do so. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi, Mark. I'm Mark Vanderlinden. I work 
with the Gaming Commission as Director of Research and Responsible Gaming. So, um, now I thought I would just kind of go through and just give a, a bit of an overview. Won't go into any great detail, but uh, uh, about the research agenda. Certainly, there's far greater detail, and if you have any questions at all, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm going to give you links to a lot of the um, a lot of the reports that exist out there. Um, I also want to say uh, some of the research that I'm going to be talking about uh, largely relates to Region B. I recognize that I'm talking to a, a Region A group. Um, I, I'm doing that just because Region B is a little bit further ahead. Um, MGM opened about a year before, so it, I wanted to give you a clear picture of kind of the, the comprehensiveness of the, the research and what will be coming to uh, Region A. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Um, let's see here. I got to find it. Hmm. For some reason it's not showing up for me. Hold on just one second. You ever have this trouble where you're trying to find the right screen to share, but it's just not showing up for you? Mm -hmm. There you go. I'm just showing right now, I'm showing the uh, research agenda homepage. Is that right? Yep. Okay, that's not what I want to show you. <laughs> um, hold on just one second. I'm trying to get to a, a slide deck. Um, let me try a different way here real quick. Well, Mark, it looks like Teresa just hopped on to save the day for you. Okay. Hey, Teresa. <laughs> Hi. Would you mind sharing your screen of the slide deck that we had um, developed here for some reason? Oh, wait, hold on one second. I think I just found it. Now are you seeing a, a slide deck here? Yep. I think it just needed you to be on, on there. All right, I apologize for that. Um, so, Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the research agenda um, and a little bit of the background about the research agenda. So there's two pieces that really inform the work that we're doing and the type of research that we're conducting. The first and probably the biggest piece of it goes back to the expanded gaming act, the actual law that um, legalized uh, casino gambling in Massachusetts. Uh, Section 71 um, provides a lot of detail on precisely what we are uh, directed to um, do research on, the topics and the areas. Um, but generally speaking, it's to understand the social and economic effects of expanded gam gambling and use the findings to inform evidence-based policy and regulation. Um, there's a whole piece on looking at or conducting research relative to the neuroscience, psychology, sociology, epidemiology, and etiology of gambling. Um, which is interesting and, and really tells us that we have a long ways to go. Um, it's extensive um, and we probably won't touch on any on some of those areas for, for years to come. Um, hey Mark. Other, yes sir. Um, things don't seem to be scrolling through on this. We're still on the first on the cover page of your oh, okay. presentation. Hmm. Hold on one second. There we go. Can you see that slide? Section 71? Yep, yep, we got it. Okay, um, 
So as I was saying, Section 71 of the Expanded Gaming Act provides a lot of direction for, for us to go from. The other piece of it is a responsible gaming framework. And this is a document that the Gaming Commission developed primarily to inform um, our responsible gaming strategies um, to so that the Gaming Commission and our licensees are on the same page in terms of the, the type of work that they will be doing. But there's a whole other piece to this, which is uh, to create and translate knowledge to support evidence-based decision-making about gambling policy and regulation. Um, this piece really um, is important because it, you know, we're we're generating a lot of data. We're we're creating a, a number of reports, but there, as you know, that the reports are only as good as as they are uh, being used to inform um, policy and regulation. So what I see is that between these two documents, it really provides a pretty clear set of marching orders for us. So the MGC doesn't carry out the research agenda on our own. Um, we rely um, exclusively on contractors to, um, uh, to carry out the research agenda. Our primary vendor for the social and economic research, and certainly the, the research that I think this group would probably most be interested in, is being carried about, out by um, UMass Amherst, their School of Health, um, and, and health sciences, um, that that group is the uh, overall contractor um, for a lot of the economic work that is being done. Um, they are in a partnership with the UMass Donahue Institute. Um, this is important because it's, uh, this, this represents a neutral um, body academic of academics that are carrying out the research agenda and the, and the, the studies, specific studies. Um, and this is unique in Massachusetts. There's a lot, a fair amount of gambling related research looking at both the social and economic impacts of, of casino gambling um, in the United States. But um, to have this type of neutral body carrying out the research is, is actually unique and an important aspect of it. Um, so the methodological principles, just real quick, it's, it's simple. It's how much money, when we, how much money is uh, involved and where does it come from and where is it going? Assessing the impacts uh, for years before and years after um, the introduction of casino venues. This includes both the social impacts as well as the economic impacts. So if you take a look at the, um, the studies that have been done, a vast majority of them, at, even at this point, are, are setting the baseline so that we have something to look at for, for the years to come. And then finally, compre comprehensively assessing the potential economic and social impacts and utilizing multiple sources of information to, for triangulation. Um, wherever possible, we want to try to look at multiple sources of information um, that cover the same area. It, it does a much uh, better job of uh, being able to determine causation um, if you're looking at multiple sources of data. So just uh, building the baseline. So we, we took a look at, we used primary and secondary data sources, um, looked at both statewide as well as, as regionally for each of the locations where casinos are. Um, we have baseline indicators, as I said before, in both uh, social and health, as well as economic and fiscal. Um, to drill down just a little bit further in the, the social and health, um, we covered these uh, specific dimensions, looking at problem gambling, crime, population health, demographic impacts, and environmental impacts. Um, and you can see below that, it, it speaks to the specific uh, types of studies that, that are being carried out. Um, on the economic and fiscal side, again, the kind of the big bucket areas that we're taking a look at are direct casino impact. Um, and so, for example, within direct casino impacts, we're looking at employment, revenue, and expenditures. Um, and we're looking at personal income, business establishments, real estate and housing, and government fiscal. So a, an example of how we take this data and uh, try to, to extend it or reach out to as many people as we can 
is just last month we had, uh, we have an annual research day every year, but um, the one that we, the annual event that we had um, last month rolled out a number of different um, studies that focus specifically on the impacts of MGM Springfield. So you can see here that there was, there was a, a, we've done a study looking at new employees of MGM um, Springfield. This includes reasons why people are seeking employment, their employment status prior to joining MGM, um, their geographic residence of employees. Um, we did a release findings from a patron survey. Um, and this was really an important piece of looking at this, going back to what are the methodological principles, where is the money coming from? So taking a look at how much money was coming from out-of-state gamblers versus in-state gamblers. gamblers what parts of the economy was uh, uh, money coming into MGM Casino? Where was that being diverted from? Or what percentage of that was being diverted from other sectors of the economy? Um, we did uh, MGM first year operations report, looking at the full economic impact, not just the dollars and cents, but the, both the direct and indirect impact of, of MGM on, the, uh, on Springfield, on the, the region, and, and on the state. And then finally, probably one of the, the most significant studies was taking a look at the gambling attitudes, participation, and problem gambling. So if you, we think about impacts that um, a casino could possibly have when they open up into an area. How does it, how does it affect people's gambling behavior? Um, do they continue to gamble, but just more now that there, there is a casino? Um, does a prevalence rate of problem gambling um, increase because you're introducing a new casino that's just down the street versus versus um, a situation where you'd have to drive um, quite a distance in order to, to get to a casino. Um, those are the types of questions that we, we address. And it, again, it goes back to kind of what is our mandate um, as it relates to Section 71 of, of the Expanded Gaming Act. Um, I provided a link to you, both uh, the, the video presentation as well as just the slide deck if you want to fast forward to specific areas. Um, this just covered part of the way in which we're taking a look at um, impacts um, within each of the region. And again, think about this is, this is kind of, this is where Springfield and MGM is, and, and this is where we're heading with, uh, with Region A. Um, Sorry, just so the there that wasn't the the full extent of the research that's being done here. The other areas we take a look at real estate impacts, um, both residential and um, commercial uh, trends, um, both be looking at uh, the baseline. So before MGM Springfield, as well as um, after the casino opened, uh, we take a look at the impact of of the casinos on public safety. So this is actually a, an interesting area that we have, uh, we released the first post opening um, report for Encore Boston Harbor. Um, but we will continue to take a look at um, in doing a, a pretty extensive analysis on um, crimes, calls for service and, and collisions um, uh, in the um, host community and in surrounding communities. Um, so we've, we've already uh, set up, a, we've done a baseline for Encore, we've done a six-month report, and the 12-month report is, is in the works right now, though it's, like many things, um, complicated with the, the presence of COVID and the shutdown of the casino for the, the period of time um, during that first year of their, their operation. Um, there was a, a report on the construction of MGMs. Um, and this report for Encore Boston Harbor is actually expected to be released within, uh, within probably the next month. Actually, it's on the commission agenda right now for December 3rd. I'm hopeful that we'll hit that mark, but I'll, I'll make sure that I send out the notice of that to Joe and Tanya. Um, uh, we also did a, a, a host community profile for Springfield as well as Everett, um, setting baselines on a lot of the different conditions within the, the cities. Um, and it, it may seem odd that we take a look at lottery revenue, um, but we do to the extent that um, within the Expanded Gaming Act, it ex explicitly stated that um, we are uh, we need to protect um, protect 
the, the lottery because it's a major source of revenue um, to local aid around the state. Um, here is, uh, the, the top is the link to the um, Gaming Commission research page. It's easily um, sorted. So if there's a specific area of research or a specific study in any of these areas, you can easily navigate through it um, and find the study that, that you would be looking for. Um, you can sort it by um, region. So you can look at um, Everett or Springfield. Um, anyway, it's a, it's, we, we recently revamped the website in order for it to be a little bit more easily used. Um, another area that I wanted to draw attention to is MODE, the Massachusetts Open Data Exchange. Um, we are sitting on, on uh, a mountain of data um, that um, our research teams have done a great job of doing, um, uh, of using and analyzing and um, doing multivariate as well as univariate analyses on, in a number of different ways, but that's to me the, the tip of the iceberg. So um, there is a way for um, researchers to access the, the data, um, to get the raw data files to do their own analyses. Um, we're hopeful that this will be, in the years to come, a, a rich source of, of new information using the existing data that we, we have right now. That's the research in a nutshell. Um, before I kick it over to Teresa to talk a little bit about the um, Gaming Commission's responsible gaming efforts. I was wondering if, if does anybody have any questions at all? Um, I provided a very high level overview. So, hey, Mark, this is Joe. Um, I was just wondering, you know, given, especially you know, with Encore, I mean, you know, with MGM, luckily we had um, a period of time of continuous operations. Where now with Encore, you've got. You know, we get less than a year of it being open full time. Then we went into the shutdown. Then we went back into the reopening, and now we're at a modified number of hours. I guess, do you see us needing to get back to a real steady state of operations, of full operations, before you can really make any good assessments? Um, that's that's such a good question, and I I have such a bad answer, um, which is. I don't entirely know. So um, I think, so one of the studies that, that's in the work, it works from the UMass Donahue Institute, is a study looking at what have been the impacts of COVID on the, the gaming industry in, in Massachusetts. Um, I think, and, and it's primarily drawing upon, it's exclusively drawing upon secondary data, both um, what would come from our operators, but also data that's a, other secondary data that, that is available. I think that it's almost as if we're setting a new baseline um, moving forward and that we will take a look at, at impacts of casinos during this time, but there's, there's probably gonna be a big asterisk bes beside each of, each of the reports during this period of time. Um, it's it's uh, it's still worth taking a look at. I think that our casino operators play a, a role in both generating tax revenue and providing jobs and economic um, benefit to the host and, and surrounding communities. Um, and it's probably you know arguably really as important now as it was when the expanded gaming act was passed for those those exact reasons. So. Um, sorry, I've kind of talked around your uh, your your question, but that's the I think that's the best answer I can give you. Anybody else? Any other questions? If I may, the the uh, uh, COVID impact report, economic impact report. Um, they're probably they're going to obviously we got to cut it off at some point with some time parameters on that. So. Uh, the time frame for that is looking at uh, calendar year 20. So you get a, a picture of, of um, operations just before COVID. You get the, the period where the casinos were shut down um, and re reopened. Um, we know that this is probably going to extend for quite some time, but we'll be taking a look at that snapshot of, of time where we get a variety of different scenarios here. Uh, Mark? Yes, Rick. 
Well, I mean, Joe made the point. I mean, it's it's very hard for you to get a, a gauge where we really haven't been open a full year, um, especially you know, especially in the the employment aspect of, of what's happening. You know, people have been you know every time you turn around, people you know more and more people are getting laid off over there. But I think the uh, the employment aspect has been uh, really a hurt to the community. Uh, as I say, uh, you know, I, I don't think anyone says no friends that that, that work there that are no longer working there are on some type of furlough. And you know, I am, um, and I've got friends in the gaming community in Las Vegas too. Uh, they're feeling the same impact out there too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, the gaming, you know, the gaming community throughout the whole country is, uh, is suffering because you know the COVID, you know, uh, mm -hmm. isn't immune to uh, any other state. So, uh, like I say, you know, I've got uh, in Las Vegas, they're they're barely at thirty percent mm -hmm. uh, how they're operating over there. So, uh, you know, it's, I, I know it's hard for you to get uh, something. You know, like I say, especially when we haven't had a full year. So I would think that at some point, uh, once we get back open, you know, this group will go back and, and get a year of, of, you know, a full year to date uh, study on this uh, on, on this region anyways. Yeah. And so the, the idea, Rick, is that we, you know, these operation reports, taking a look at the, the impacts is an annual, it's on an annual rolling basis. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. I, I hope that what we're looking at is a, a blip in time where we will definitely see an impact on the casino industry in Massachusetts and that um, and that we'll have a sustained number of years afterwards that you can really begin to see kind of a prolonged impact of the, the gaming industry in, in Massachusetts. But I, I, I hear everything you're saying. Any other questions for Mark? Okay, here we can see that. Mark, you have more. You have more information you want to go over? Yeah, uh, Teresa, are you? Okay, let me just stop sharing my screen. Um, hey, Teresa. Uh, so I'm going to turn it. Teresa Fiore is a program manager um, for research and responsible gaming. Um, her primary area of focus is is the GameSense program. So uh, she'll tell you a little bit about that, as well as the the voluntary self exclusion program. So. Um, Teresa has a few minutes to talk about that you as well. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen with you all. Okay, can everyone see that? Good. Um, so thank you for having um, me today. Um, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the Game Sense program, but the Gaming Commission is required by statute to provide an on-site service to help mitigate gambling-related harm and to respond to persons within the casino who may already be struggling with their gambling. Um, and so for anyone who doesn't know before, you know, I talk a bit about the foundations of the program, this is realized through an on-site what we call Game Sense Info Center, which is an office just off of the gaming floor in a high traffic area that is staffed by trained professionals in responsible and problem gambling. Um, so we were operating um, under a 24 seven pilot program. Um, unfortunately, of course, we had to cut back due to the casino hourly restrictions. Um, but we try to be there um, for as many guests and as many staff members as possible. Um, so let me advance this. Can everyone see these changing? Great. Um, so what is Game Sense? We define it as an innovative, responsible gaming program, which encourages players to adopt and or maintain positive behaviors and attitudes that reduce the risk of gambling-related harm. Um, so what we mean by that is, you know, we want all individuals visiting Encore Boston Harbor or any of the three casinos in Massachusetts to um, keep gambling as a safe form of entertainment and never progress to the level where their gambling is starting to negatively impact any area of their lives. Now, should they already be presenting with um, a gambling problem, our Game Sense advisors are there to respond directly to those individuals and we have tools and resources available for them. <clears throat> Um, so who does GameSense serve? Primarily, we are there to support casino patrons, anyone coming in and out of um, 
the you know the casino um, our game test advisors will work with will try to engage and speak with we also have in casino advertising promoting both the game sense program and responsible gaming tips as well as resources for persons um, who have developed um, a harm or a problem with their gambling <clears throat> And um, our sort of communication foundation is based on what we call a stepped care approach, which means that we are going to communicate to individuals differently depending on their level of gambling engagement, their behavior, um, and how you know they're reacting to the presence of gambling in the Commonwealth. So it's a sort of safe level. We have positive players. So. Um, you know, information that a positive player might need is very different than what an at-risk or a problem player might need. Um, so on, you know, the problem end of the spectrum, we have what we call a voluntary self-exclusion program, which is a program which allows persons to voluntarily exclude themselves from the gaming floor of any Massachusetts casino. And again, we see VSC, the voluntary self-exclusion, um, abbreviated as the VSC program, um, is a tool to help individuals who may be struggling. Um, GameSense is also there to support casino employees. So um, we, you know, we put a lot of time and a lot of effort in providing trainings to all new hires within the casino as well as providing ongoing and refresher trainings at a more advanced level um, to shift managers, to um, casino leadership, anyone who sort of requires that extra level of knowledge um, in individuals who we like to work with and have personal relationships with because they can really help to you know, further our miss mission of ensuring that all players um, who enter the casino are playing in a healthy way. Um, <clears throat> This is a program um, which between 2015 and I want to say 2018 was evaluated um, by a third party, the Cambridge Health Alliance Division on Addiction. And as part of that evaluation, um, the researchers found that 88% of casino employees rated the responsible gaming trainings as very good or excellent. Um, so we think we're doing a pretty good job with those, but there's something which we are constantly working with casino leadership to evolve um, and update so they're as relevant as possible for casino staff. Um, casino uh, Game Sense Advisors also work out in the community. So um, most recently, they've been working with high-risk groups, say seniors at community centers um, who may have a trip planned to one of the casinos to share with them responsible gaming tips before they even get to the casino and to introduce themselves, you know, actually show their faces, whether it be digitally or in person, um, to encourage them to say, hey, you know, if you have any issues when you're at the casino, please feel free to um, visit us at the Game Sense Info Center. Um, so here's a, a picture, I don't know if you can see my mouse of the GameSense Info Center. This um, one happens to be at MGM Springfield. Um, so we try to design them as welcoming spaces where guests and staff can walk in, have a casual conversation. Um, they're also equipped with private offices for individuals who may be struggling with their gambling and want to have a more sensitive conversation. Um, with our game sense advisor. So we try to be as flexible as possible to meet all guests and staff um, wherever they need to be met and however, you know, they're comfortable. <clears throat> um, so is, you know, one of the sort of programs which I consider to be a tool within um, the sort of game sense toolkit is Play My Way. And that is a budget management program um, that's currently in pilot at Plain Ridge Park Casino. It allows individuals to set a predetermined um, monetary limit on their, um, their EGM electronic gaming machine spending, um, and it notifies them as they approach and even exceed their preset budget. So we, you know, there's different variations of this across the world. Um, in Massachusetts, we have sort of taken the stance where we want to provide as much real-time information as possible without, you know, cutting people off. Um, and the idea behind that is that they may not be ready for that, so it may not necessarily be beneficial to them. But we feel that between Play My Way, between Game Sense, we have sort of the tools that people need um, to maintain gambling at a healthy level. 
Um, and voluntary self-exclusion is the other big program um, that sort of falls within the GameSense toolkit. So like I said, this is a program where individuals who are struggling with their gambling um, can voluntarily enter into a contract with the Mass Gaming Commission um, where they say, hey, you know, I'm struggling. I do not want to be allowed on the gaming floor um, of any Massachusetts casino. You know, can you help me invoke this control? Um, so it's an in-person enrollment. Um, more than 85% of them are done with our Game Sense advisors. So again, you have that um, really important face-to-face -face touch point. Um, in this, you know, I have 779 individuals currently enrolled in the program. That number is more like 875 now. Um, of persons actively enrolled in the program and another 160, I would say, who have gone through the program and removed themselves from the program. Uh, so I, I touched a bit on community engagement and some of those, um, you know, presentations and trainings that we do out in the community. We also have a website where individuals can access our information 24 seven and get in touch with the Game Sense Advisor um, if they're at home, if they're on the road, um, and that you know can be accessed through gamesensema.com. These are just some metrics, a quick snapshot of the program. Um, I especially like these graphics. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, um, but you can see each of these symbols represent <coughs> A casino staff member in the green symbol. I don't think I can zoom in, but you can see I'm pointing to it right here. The green symbol represents um, the Game Sense Advisor to, you know, however many staff that casino has. So I think it really illustrates how important casino staff buy-in and training is, especially when we're thinking about the larger casinos like Encore, uh, like MGM. <clears throat> Some more metrics, um, advertising and marketing. So like I said, we do have in-casino signage, which is branded according to GameSense standards. You can see um, this is a slot bank, I believe at Plainridge Park Casino. And it's hard to tell, but this is actually one of my favorite ads. It's a cartoon of Benjamin Franklin, and it just says, keep your Benjamins on a budget. And the call to action is, you know, visit the GameSense Info Center to learn more about setting a budget and sticking to it. Um, so that's sort of the theme and the tone of a lot of our messages. Um, we have also, um, you know, held advertising space on buses. I believe this is a bus um, in Springfield on the casino route in downtown. Um, and then, you know, these are just some more screenshots of our website where we have some interactive elements. Uh, Game Sense in the news. We have been picked up by a few different news sources, which is always um, exciting and a lot of work, um, but it is good to see us getting our name out there since it is such an important program. Um, and, you know, we have really great feedback on the effectiveness of the program, you know, not only from guests, from staff who use the program, <clears throat> but also through our evaluation. Um, and here's just a picture of one of our Game Sense teams. So right now, I want to see we have 21 staff members um, known as Game Sense advisors across all three casinos um, within the Commonwealth. And like I said, you know, they're reachable pretty much at any time at this point um, online, even if they can't physically be at the casinos in person around the clock any longer. Um, and that is all I have for the Game Sense piece. I touch a little bit on Play My Way. I touch a little bit on voluntary self exclusion. Um, were there any questions, or Joe, Mark, um, did you have any other topics you wanted me to cover in my few minutes? That was good. Thanks, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing else. Nothing else from me, Teresa. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? I do have a question. Mara. And the question is, do you do once uh, we have participants joining this program, do you do a pre and post uh, evaluation? And if so, how that those look like? 
Sure. So for voluntary self-exclusion, um, I think that's a program you're referring to. Yes, we did evaluate that program in 2017. Um, and there was a pre and post done. Um, it's something which we actually would like to evaluate again, but you know, with COVID, it doesn't make sense to do right now. Um, but the finding um, that really jumps to mind right now without calling up the actual report is that individuals who enrolled in our program um, rated it much more highly than voluntary self exclusion programs which they had enrolled in in other states and jurisdictions. Um, and we attribute much of that to, you know, the very reader friendly FAQs that we have available in multiple languages in brochures. Um, we attribute that to that sort of in person component of the enrollment where somebody can really sit down, um, not feel judged, not feel like they're getting in trouble, which um, has been the feedback about BSC programs in other jurisdictions and just feel like they're having a conversation with somebody who's really there to support their choice, um, realizing that it is a really, really difficult choice. Um, so I would say that that's sort of the top finding that comes to mind. I don't know if you had any other specific questions about it, but that evaluation is available on the research page, which Mark mentioned. And actually, Teresa, the, the other piece of this that actually I, I find really important too is um, how are people doing after they enroll in the voluntary self-exclusion program? Have they reduced? Have they reduced their gambling? Are there? How is their mental health and health? Um, and in each of those areas, um, by and large, you would you see improvements of individuals who enroll in the program um, at follow up. And that's that's not uncommon of voluntary self exclusion programs. Um, but as Teresa said, that some of the enhancements, the engagement um, strategies that we use, I think, also uh, come out in that. We've also done an evaluation of the GameSense uh, program um, and taking a look at, you know, what is people's gambling literacy and um, uh, pre-commitment to how much they want to spend. Um, and uh, there's there's a host of areas in which, which people take a look at. Um, the results of the evaluations that, that we have um, have led to um, enhancements to the program. So for example, um, right now we're, we're, we're working on um, what's called uh, an initiative called Positive Play, where we begin to say, you know, not all players are the same. What do we know from our evaluation? What do we know from other research where we can begin to tailor the, the message that um, we're delivering to specific types of, of patrons so that it resonates more or it's more targeted um, to help people stay uh, than kind of that healthy or safe range of, of gambling. Thank you. And my follow-up question is for how long an individual stay in the program? Do you have an average? The voluntary self-exclusion program? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa, you have that data, I believe. You know, since I pulled that number, I'm pretty sure that it has changed, um, but we offer various terms for individuals. So um, the shortest term is one year, uh, followed by three years, five years, and then we have a lifetime option um, upon completion of one of those shorter terms. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, I can certainly get you the overall average. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And and I'd say that it's it's kind of split um, amongst the terms. One of the interesting things, Teresa, you did, uh, is that since casinos reopened, the most common duration is one year, um, as opposed to a longer term pre pre COVID. And um, I think anecdotally, we heard from the Game Sense team that people took that break that three month break when casinos were closed um, and felt like they wanted to extend that break um, for a, a slightly longer period. Um, so an interesting byproduct um, from, from the COVID shutdown. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, is that it? Uh, any more questions, Joe? You have more more input, Joe? Um, just uh, just on the next steps. 
if there's no more questions on the um, on the research agenda, um, just some of our next steps. So this sort of concludes our uh, this group's work for this year. Once the guidelines come out, but for your information, um, a few things. Once I think I mentioned earlier, this Thursday the commission will be taking up the guidelines, and assuming that they approve them. We will then go out with our solicitation. We're actually out a fairly bit earlier this year than we have been in the past couple. Uh, the past couple of years, we've gone into December before we finalize these. So this will give the communities a little bit extra time to get their applications together, which is good. Um, and as I said, we're gonna hold three uh, workshops uh, between December and January. Uh, the first one being for, uh, you know, once the, once the commissioners approve this, we're going to send out a letter to all of those communities that haven't expended their reserves and, you know, explain to them the, the, um, the process, you know, the, the, the new process. And then what we're going to do is in the middle of December, thereabouts, we're going to have a workshop with those folks to try to, you know, we'll talk through some, you know, with some of the other good projects people have done and, and see if there's a good way to get get those funds um, spent. And then in January, I said we'll do a workshop for the workforce uh, applications, because that's really a sort of a completely different animal than, than some of our other uh, uh, grant applications. And then we'll do a, a third one for sort of the general grant programs. You know, again, we want to stress to folks that you got to find that nexus to the casino. And we want to really see, uh, you know, the hope is that these uh, outreach sessions will maybe get some people thinking a little bit and also maybe help us get a little bit better applications than maybe maybe we have in the past. Um, so we have those coming up. And then of course the application deadline is January 31st, um, which is actually on a Sunday. Um, and normally under normal circumstances, we would uh, either push it to the Friday before the Monday after. Um, but since everything's done online here and through the, the combi system, um, we just kept it with the 31st of, of January. Um, so those are the things that we have coming up. Um, I think in the past we have talked about um, trying to maybe reconvene this group a couple of times during the year. And I think um, thus far we haven't been terribly successful in that. Um, I think we have done it a little bit in the past, but um, you know, I think the idea is we would like to have this become a bit more of a regular type thing than just happening in the fall, maybe a meeting in the spring after we get applications and we could maybe walk through that a little bit and 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 maybe talk about some of the other things that the Gaming Commission does just to keep uh, these groups informed. That's why, you know, we had Mark come to this one to talk about that system and we have, you know, other things going on as well. So um, I guess with that, um, I guess that was all that I had. Mary, did you have any last uh, thoughts? We can hear you, Mary. You're still muted there, Mary. I'm sorry, I always do that. <laughs> uh, no, just trying to make sure everyone knows the dates um, and, you know, let it, be known in your communities that we're going to be having these dates to keep an eye out on the website. We'll be sending a lot of emails out regarding these meetings to assist people with their applications, which is it's kind of exciting that we're, we actually have time this year to be able to do that. Um, there is going to be a, a public safety report that's going to be coming out sometime in March. So maybe that's around April and maybe somewhere we could try and schedule a meeting around then once the study comes out. I think you'd find that interesting. Um, other than that, I think we're good. I'm all Mary, set. Mary, I, I lost my screen. Oh, yeah. Um, Mary, if, if you could send the committee out uh, the outreach. Uh, Workshop date so we can get it to yes. our people. Yes. Uh, that'd yes. be that'd be helpful, you know, in case they're not, you know, everyone's busy with all stuff and then this way we can do it. And uh, um, I don't see why we, we can't schedule a meeting now for uh, sometime in April just to Ooh. get back together. I mean, uh, there's no reason why. Joe, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be great. Yeah. 
just 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 to convene then to let everybody know what's happening and if we have to do another meeting then we have to uh, yeah well why don't why don't we just take a we'll take a look at the schedule a little bit and and yeah, send out I mean, an we're, we're far out as it is anyways but let's plan on an april uh, an april meeting okay okay uh any further business uh none on this side yeah any old business coming anybody has any old business they need to discuss Hearing and seeing none. Uh, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, second. And Tanya, if you can call the roll. Yep. Okay. Keith Slattery. Yes. Justin Starrett. Paul Sheehan. Aye. John DePriest. Yes. Ron Hogan. Yes. Richard Carviello. Yes. Brad Rawson, Barasa Pinzi, uh, David Bancroft? Yes. And Myra Negron Roche? Yes. All right, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. If I could wish everybody a, a safe Thanksgiving and, uh, and Christmas. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Same to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.